right, so I think most of you know that uh, this is the second Sunday in December, but did you guys know that there's just 12 more days before Christmas? Okay, we've got one person who's excited about that. Um, here's the thing, though. I, I, you know, the 12 days of Christmas, I, I don't really know if that is like the 12 days leading up to Christmas, but if it is, and if the song has taught us anything, um, your true love should be giving you what today? A partridge in a pear tree. Loved ones, have you have you decided? I don't think I've seen a partridge or a pear tree in a long, long time. So I don't think that's happening, at least in my life. And I don't have any plans for you, honey. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, um, I would like to actually get it started today by just sharing with you some statistics that I ran across having to do with Christmas. I think it will just kind of generate some ideas that we're heading towards today. Um, I read this uh, this past week that 92% of Americans are going to celebrate Christmas this year. That's almost everybody is going to celebrate Christmas, at least here in the United States. Uh, 25 to 30 million real Christmas trees are going to be sold this year. How many of you have bought one of those real Christmas trees? Kind of like our real Christmas tree right over here. I mean, you can smell the pine. It's not an air freshener. It's Okay, that's a lie. It's not, it's not real. Did, so no one's bought a real Christmas tree. Okay, you guys are not part of the 25 to 30 million who do that. Well, in 2018, households in the United States actually spent on average $1,536 at Christmas. Now, that's, that's kind of, that's a lot until you hear that Bruce actually spent double that amount on my Christmas gift this year alone. <laughs> I'm, I've got high expectations, Bruce. I really do. <laughs> Holiday retail sales, again, in 2018, actually surpassed $1 trillion. That's a ton of gifts being bought. And then finally, the last one, 89% of Americans will decorate a Christmas tree for their house at Christmas. How many of you at least have some sort of Christmas tree at your house decorated? Small, big, fake, real? Okay, yeah, that's, that's pretty much all of us. Um, What's interesting is we as a society, we as a country, we spend a ton of time like preparing ourselves for Christmas in some way. You know, some of us, all we do is listen to Christmas music around this, this time. Some of us, we're a little bit more intentional. Maybe we start to think about all the different people in our lives that we want to buy gifts for, and it would be an insult not to buy them a gift, so your list is long. Others of you, you're on the other side, like your planning for Christmas is just like dropping hints to your loved ones, this is what I want for Christmas, right? Uh, some of you just wear the Christmas sweaters, uh, others of you, you get really excited about making the candy or baking the, the cookies and decorating them with your kids. There's all kinds of stuff that we do to prepare for Christmas, but for us as a church, what I want us to do for the next few weeks, starting last week actually, we want to prepare our hearts. We want to prepare our hearts, not just for those good things of Christmas, but maybe for some of the great things that we might miss otherwise. There's so many good things about Christmas, but sometimes we can get lost in those good things and we can miss out on the great. We began the series, Don't Miss It, last week, and if you're with us, you remember that really the key ingredient that we didn't want to miss at this time of season is the fact that the Christmas is about light which seems a little strange, but we looked at an ancient prophecy that talked about this coming Savior. And so Christmas is really about how we have this Savior, Jesus, who has invaded the darkness of our souls. And not only did he save us from our sins, but he packed us full of his glory and his love and his hope and his power. And we are not just to receive that, but we're supposed to actually shine that into the world around us. And so I hope that this week, you guys have looked for creative ways that you can shine Christ's light and his life to the world around you. Well, today, I want us to get into another aspect of something really great that we shouldn't miss at Christmas. Uh, and in order to do this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce it kind of in a different way. Uh, I want to just kind of highlight a few big events that took place in the Bible. And I want you, you can just kind of answer this in your mind, but I want you to try to figure out, okay, what was happening in that individual's life before the big event? And what if the big event didn't happen? What would probably have continued in their life? So let's just think of Moses for a moment. What was his life plan before God appeared to him in a burning bush? Then just kind of process, what was he up to? Well, first of all, he was a shepherd, right? And he was about 80 years old. So when you're 80 and you're a shepherd, you're probably just thinking, well, I'm going to coast until the day I die. But God had a different plan, didn't he? Now let's think about Jonah. Um, what was his plan before God called him to preach against Nineveh? You guys remember, there was just like one or two verses that we have in the, the Old Testament that talk about that. He was a prophet 
and he was bringing good news to God's people. And if you've ever brought good news to people, you want to keep bringing good news. You don't necessarily want to bring bad news. But again, God had a different plan. All right, let's bring it into New Testament. Um, Peter and, and his brother Andrew, what were they doing before Jesus says, hey, come follow me? They were fishing. And if Jesus didn't say, come follow me, they probably would have continued that as a career path. What about Jesus? We'll just think of you know, a, an event that happened in his life. Um, what was he doing right before the roof um, that he was, the, the house that he was in, the, the roof began to peel away and a man was dropped in who was paralyzed and people were expecting a miracle. What was he doing? He was teaching and he probably would have just continued teaching that day. But again, something unexpected took place. What about Paul on his way to Damascus? What was his plan before Jesus has this miraculous encounter with him? Yeah, his life plan was to take this, this cult, this sect, and basically destroy it. But again, God had a different plan. You guys seen a pattern? You guys seen a theme here? That God's story in human history is a story of interruption. Like over and over and over again, God's story in human history is a story of interruption. Just try to, let's just take the gospel, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Try to share what's in the gospel, by, but just remove all the interruptions from it. You're really not left with a whole lot, are you? No Zacchaeus. No woman healed of bleeding. No woman washing his feet. No first miracle, right? That was mom interrupting Jesus' plans, just have a fun time at a party. She's like, no, you got to take care of this. He's like, oh, fine, water into wine, I'll do it. What is God's story in human history? It's a story of interruptions. So here's the thing. At Christmas time, what do we not want to miss? What we don't want to miss is that it's actually just one big interruption after the other. And so I think we need to wrestle with a question today. And this is one that I want you to wrestle with not only today, but tomorrow and this next week. What if God wants to interrupt your life? Are you interruptible? If God's story throughout human history, if Christmas is one interruption after the other, well, the big question we have to wrestle with is, are we interruptible? Today we're going to look at and explore an interruption. And it's an interruption that takes place at Christmas, and it's one that you're pretty familiar with. This is an interruption that takes place to a sweet young girl named Mary. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 1. We're going to start reading in verse 26. This interruption starts this way. <clears throat> in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary... And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled. We're just going to pause there for a moment. Why was Mary troubled? You know, if you are a student of scripture, you probably think to yourself, well, an angelic being, you know, from heaven, that's a frightening thing. In fact, we see that pattern in the Bible, that an angel shows up and there's just immediately fear because they're trying to process it and they don't have this idea in their mind. They don't have any frame of reference for this experience. And so fear is typically the response. But did you notice that's not actually why Mary is afraid? Let's continue reading the rest of the verse. It says, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Why is she troubled? Why is she disturbed? Well, it's his words. So let's go back and let's read once again. What are the words of this angel? Well, the words are, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. To be honest, that would not be troubling to me. If an angel showed up and said, Hey, Jonathan, man, God has seen you, and he is really excited about what he's seen. That would not trouble me. It'd be like, oh, awesome. I I'm really excited about that. So why in the world is this troubling Mary? Is it possible that she just, she just doesn't realize, realize that, that she would be capable of bringing this type of invitation? That in her mind, she's just thinking, maybe the angel has the wrong person? That she's looking behind her and she's thinking, are you, are you speaking to someone else? It, really, me? Have you ever been in a situation like this? Maybe not with an angelic being, right? But someone has come to you and they've given you a task or responsibility and they thought you were the perfect person for the job. And the whole time you're thinking, oh my goodness, this is so beyond my skill level. I, I am so the wrong person for this job. Have any of you ever had that experience before? This happens to me almost every single time someone asks me 
to spell something. You heard that right. Anytime someone asks me to spell something, it's like, I'm the wrong guy. I, I'm not the guy you should be asking. And in fact, my, my kids will come to me and they'll say, hey, Dad, how do you spell? And I'm like, the first thing I do is I look behind me and I, I say, okay, you realize mom is right here. Why are you asking me? She is the, hands down, the best speller in the house. You need to go to her. And they just kind of roll their eyes. I say, Dad, I just wanted to make sure I spelled the word the right. <laughs> And I look at him and I say, I said you got the wrong guy. No, I'm, <laughs> it's not that bad. It's, it's bad, but it's not quite that bad. But is it possible that Mary, in this situation, she's just thinking to herself, wait, th is it me that you want? Are you really, is this message for me? Because I know you haven't asked me to do anything yet. This is just really encouraging words, but maybe you're trying to encourage someone else. I, I kind of look like my mom. Maybe you're, maybe you're actually wanting to talk to my mom. She's right around the corner. I'll go get mom for you. In our lives, I think we can find ourselves in this situation too, and I think it's important to understand where Mary's at in her life. And verse 27 kind of gives us some insight into where she's at. In verse 27, what do we read? We read that she's pledged to be mar married to a man by the name of Joseph. So she's engaged, she's engaged. I don't know if you've been around uh, ladies, uh, young women who are engaged to be married, but if you've been around young ladies who are engaged to be married any time recently, you know that they can be preoccupied. <laughs> they can be preoccupied with what? The wedding ceremony and all the planning, can't they? Have you ever found yourself just kind of being overwhelmed with their like world? It's a world of bridal magazines, of Pinterest posts, of the right color for the bridesmaid dresses, to see, okay, wait, should this bride uh, maid be a part of the party? I, I, my the, the husband to be, he only has so many friends, and I, you know, I, how do I, right? Their, their mind is, is trying to figure out all these, these wonderful things that, that brides have to figure out. And let's be honest, I don't want to make this like a sexist thing because, because guys, we're a little preoccupied if we're engaged to be married too, right? I mean, we're so preoccupied with, of course, the wedding, wedding ceremony. Like that's, that's what we're preoccupied with. I mean, all throughout high school, what, what did we fantasize about? I mean, it was, it was a wedding. Ceremony is what we were really focused on. I mean, just the idea of lighting that unity candle with our bride. I mean, that, okay, maybe we were distracted with other things. But this is where Mary's at. She's engaged. And so she's got this whole plan. She's got this whole idea for her life. And she, now this messenger from God, from heaven, is telling her, hey, you're highly favored. And, and, and she knows this is a lead up to something, but she's got some plans for her life. It's an engagement. And if you are familiar with this text, you've probably heard a few sermons on it, and you know that engagements in the first century are a little different than engagements in our culture. Uh, engagements today, if you find somebody that you connect with, you want to spend the rest of your life with them, well, you propose, and you have a, a short engagement of maybe six months or so, and then you get married, and, and things are good. But in the first century, you may not have even been a part of the process. Of, of finding that right somebody. It might have been your families, right? One family, they got this brilliant idea. So they go to the other family and they say, hey, we've got this great idea. And they say, oh, you know what? That is a good idea. And you're left on the outside thinking, man, I really hope that that's a good idea because I'm not so sure. And, and then the engagement doesn't actually become official until money has exchanged hands, until actually possibly even land has exchanged hands. But once the money exchanged hands, then it becomes official. It's actually a legal binding contract, covenant between those two families. And, and what, would it, what would happen is probably about a year uh, of engagement would be normal. Uh, it was just enough time for the husband-to-be to go and build a house for his new bride. About a year to raise some funds, uh, have some sort of nest egg so that he can now take care of the bride and hopefully the children to come. And if anyone wanted out of the engagement, in that year period, well, it required not just you giving the ring back and saying, you know what, the other night we were hanging out and the light was just coming in and I, I just realized I don't really like unibrows. And so, you know, here's your ring back. I'm, it's not going to work out. Like you couldn't do that. Today you can, but you would actually have to get a legal divorce at that point. Now, if you're thinking about it like this, so engagement, engagement looked a lot in the first century, a lot like marriage in the sense that it was this legal contract. The one exception is that, again, the, the husband, well, he wasn't allowed to light the unity candle yet, okay? If you know what I mean, that's, that's the issue. So, so Mary here, 
Mary here is caught up. She's caught up in all this wedding plans. And now she's got this angel who's saying, hey, you know, God is liking what he's seeing here, and he's got something for you. But she's got a plan. She's already got a plan. This, is, this sounds a lot like an interruption. She has this vision of that cute little house that Joseph is building on the hillside and little kids all around. What, what is the angel going to say? So the angel continues. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Okay, Mary, I want you to understand this, Mary. God is here. He's giving you instructions. God has actually sent me as an angel to give you some instructions. I know it sounds like this massive interruption. I know you've got your plans. You've got your agenda. And there's nothing wrong with your plans. In fact, they're good plans. But God's, he's inviting you into something great. Mary, this is a divine interruption. This, this is a holy opportunity. Mary, don't miss it. Don't miss this moment. See, there is going to be a child birthed by you, and this child is not going to be any ordinary child. This is going to be a child that's going to save humanity from their sins. You can get caught up in all the good plans that you have, but you'll end up missing the great plans that God has for you. Are you interruptible, Mary? How's Mary respond? Verse 34. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. Mary says, okay, I don't know how to put this delicately. Um, Joseph hasn't lit the unity candle yet, so how can this, how can this be? That's my last unity candle joke, I, I promise. Some of you are thinking, man, I, I, I've ruined unity candle for you, like, forever. So I'm done with that, though. Um, so Mary says, how, how can this happen? How can this take place? Because, you know, that hasn't happened yet. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I empathize with Mary on so many levels. Like when something has been put on my heart and I start to process, okay, is this from God? One of the first questions I ask is the how question. Are you, any of you like that? It's a big thing. It's an interruption. I've got my plans and it's like, okay, now you want me to do this. And the first thing I ask is, okay, how, how am I able to do this? How can I do this? And I start to process it. Like, All right, well, you've, you've called me to to actually pray for this situation, but honestly, I don't see the situation changing at all, and people pray to you all the time, and you don't necessarily say yes, and I don't even feel like praying about this one. Okay, you want me to share my faith with this individual, but I actually don't even like this individual. They're so abrasive, they're so annoying, they're so frustrating. Even if they gave their life to Christ, okay, does that mean they have to be a part of my church now? Uh, do I have to see them? Because I don't even really like them. How is that possible? How is it possible when we're barely hanging on financially? How is this possible when I don't have the education? How is this possible when I don't have the experience? How is this possible? How, 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 how? And we oftentimes how it to death, don't we? Until we find ourselves being able to weasel out and say, well, I don't think that was from God anyway. See, I think it's okay to ask the how question, but don't ask how just to get out of the interruption. Because again, you might be missing, you might be missing out on great for something pretty good. Well, the angel's not disturbed at all by Mary's how question. Instead, what does he say in verse 35? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Love this response. Because I think this is a response so many of us need to hear when God calls us to something. When we experience a divine interruption, we need to hear these words as well. What are the words that basically Mary is hearing? The angel saying, oh, no, 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 no. You don't get it. This isn't a Mary thing. This is actually a God thing. Where you thought you would be the one that has to, to do all the ins and outs of figuring this out. No, no, no. God's already done the work. You just simply have to be obedient to the interruption and all those things that are outside of your control, yeah, God's going to take care of it. Don't we need to hear that from time to time? Because we just ask the how and the how, and I don't know, that's such an interruption. And God's just saying, hey, if I've called you to it, 
I've got it. I love what he says next, too. This is in verse 36. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Let me just focus on verse 37 just for a moment. It says, for no, what? Word from who? From God will ever fail. In other words, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. This is not a Mary thing. This is a God thing. And I love the fact that he also brings Elizabeth into the mix. You guys notice that? He says, hey, this miraculous thing that God is going to do in your life, no one's going to believe it. You are, at times, not even going to believe it. There, there's going to be moments where you doubt it, and you're going to think, you know, God never actually spoke to me. This is just a major interruption, and my life has completely done a 180, and I, I don't even know why I'm living the way I'm living. But understand this. God has done the miraculous in other people's lives as well. He's done the miraculous even in Elizabeth's life. Yeah, your cousin. Man, there's a child in her womb right now. And, and she's going to understand exactly what's happening to you because it's happening to her. And I think this is so significant because oftentimes we surround ourselves with people who think their job is to talk you out of what God has called you to. And I think we need to take a step back from those people at times, and we need to identify those folks in our lives who have already experienced God's miraculous work, and we need to go to them for encouragement. And we need to explain, I think this is what God is calling me to. This, this is a major interruption. I've had my plans. I've got my good things, but I think God might be calling me to this. And they're going to get it because they've already experienced it. And they're going to be able to support, and they're going to be able to encourage. Those people, i got to tell you, they're few and far between, but they're out there. And you've got to find them. You've got to connect with them. Mary, Mary's going to connect with Elizabeth. And it's going to be exactly what she needs to continue forward. So how's Mary going to respond to all this? Verse 38 says, I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, may your words to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. At this point, I think this is where the familiarity of the story probably does an injustice for us. It's an injustice because we're so familiar with it that we romanticize this story. We love the Christmas story of Jesus being born into you know, humble circumstances. We love our manger scenes. You probably have a nativity in your home or maybe even on your lawn. And so we think to ourselves, of course Mary was all for this in her life. Of course she would want to give birth to the Savior of humanity. And we forget that the yes that she says to God actually cost her so much. I mean, doesn't it cost her so much? She's going to go, and she's actually going to spend some time with Elizabeth. She's going to come back several months later, pregnant. And everybody's going to know it wasn't Joseph's. And so that's when people start to whisper, and they give her sideways looks. And that's probably the least of her problems. I mean, what did those men want to do in Jesus' ministry when that woman is caught in adultery? They want to kill her. They want to stone her, right? So Mary's dealing with some serious, serious issues here. If nothing else, she's going to have to look Joseph in the eye, and she's going to have to explain what the angels just explained to her. Is he going to believe her? Is he going to walk out on her? Is she going to spend the rest of her life alone? As this is costing her something majorly. And so what do we want to not do here? We don't want to romanticize Mary's yes. If we read this, I am the Lord's servant, and we romanticize and we say, yes, that's what I need to have in my life. And you do. You need to have that heart of obedience. But understand, when you have that heart of obedience and you're interruptible, I want to be real honest with you. You're going to have to pay a price. It will cost you something. It will cost you your convenience. It will cost you your comfort. It's going to cost you something. But more than just warning you about the cost, I want you to be encouraged by the kingdom principle that we see not only here, but throughout scripture and throughout men and women of Christ throughout the centuries. What is the kingdom principle that I want you to understand? When you give up everything, you gain Jesus. And when you gain Jesus, you gain more than you can ever imagine. See, when you, when you lay your life down, you actually gain life. Scripture tells us. 
And Mary, Mary seemed to understand that even at her young age, and so understanding this kingdom principle, how does she respond? She says, I am the Lord's servant. In other words, okay, I know this is an interruption, but God, if you're calling me to this interruption, I want to be a part of what's great. I don't want to just settle for what's good. I'm in. I know I want to have this attitude. The question, though, we have to wrestle with. If God is a God of interruptions, and his story is a story of interruptions, what if he wants to interrupt your life this week, this month, next year? Are you interruptible? Mary was interruptible. I want to be like Mary. I want to be like Mary in so many ways, but sometimes I forget this kingdom principle, that when we give up everything, we gain Jesus, and Jesus is so much more than we can ever imagine. I forget this even though I've lived it. Uh, there's been so many times in my life where I've been interrupted and I've experienced the blessing of the interruption, but sometimes I forget it and I have to remind myself. Some of the interruptions in my life, I had a plan for life after high school. God interrupted those plans and he said, you need to go off to college. I'm like, okay, fine, I'll go off to college. Such a great interruption. Uh, on, on top of getting a great education, I actually got a great wife. Uh, I would say that was definitely the it was well worth all the, the, the studying and all the, the, the checks that I had to cash in order to pay for school just to get that one, right? Um, not only was I interrupted in that sense, but even when it came to the calling of ministry, you know, being in, involved in church ministry was not my plan. That was God's plan, and I said yes to it. I can't imagine doing life, you know, outside of, of ministry. It was his interruption that led us into, on, onto the mission field. I would not have children. My life plan was to have how many kids? That's right, zero children. But I am so blessed that God interrupted that plan for a much greater plan. Even my experience with you guys, being able to partner with you guys in ministry, it wasn't necessarily my first priority, my first plan, but God interrupted my plans for even a better plan. I see this over and over again, but sometimes I just forget. Sometimes I forget, and I get so locked into my good plans that I don't want to be interrupted. And we got to wrestle with it. If God's story is a story of interruptions, are you interruptible? I want to read to you a story. Um, this is a fairly lengthy story, so bear with me. But it's a story about a woman named Karen Bennett. And uh, I'm just going to read this to you. Karen Bennett and five of her friends left the suburbs and moved into an old abandoned nightclub in one of the most dangerous areas in Atlanta. For six months, they had conducted services on the streets for the inner city children. During those encounters, God brought great clarity to the vision he had birthed in Karen during her college days. In time, it became apparent that she was to establish a unique ministry in the inner city of Atlanta. At the time, Karen was a single white female of 23 years old. As her vision began to take shape, she became convinced that there should be a safe place for children in the middle of what was and continues to be a drug-infested war zone. So Karen and her friends decided to plant a children's church in the inner city. After allowing the idea to incubate for several months, they began looking for a site. Month after month, we kept going down there until we felt like it was the time to have a church building for those kids. We started looking at old warehouses and old buildings in downtown Atlanta. Finally, we found this old nightclub that sits right in the middle of 25 major inner city projects. I called the owner and I, and I said, well, how much do you want for this place? He said he needed 2,000 a month for rent. Well, he could have told me it was 2 million. I didn't have that kind of money. But on the way home, we each stopped by our bank and cleared out our checking and savings accounts. We looked for every nickel and dime we could find. That night, we dumped it all into one pot, and between all six of us, we had a total of $52. Karen contacted a couple of churches for support. They were sympathetic, but unwilling to partner with her financially. Nobody was interested in supporting a standalone inner city children's church. Where most, uh, where most single young ladies would have taken this as a sign to channel her energies elsewhere, Karen saw it as a test of her commitment to the vision, so she called a meeting, she writes. It ended up that my staff and I got together that night, and we just talked about it. 
It was one of those nights that we just had to be honest with ourselves. Is this what we are going to do? Or was this one of those things that we were just going to talk about until we were 40 or 50 years old? So we decided that we were going to take a chance because every once in a while, you've got to do that. The next day, we went to the landlord and we handed our landlords and we handed in our notices to the leases on our apartments. We couldn't afford to have our nice apartments and have a church for those kids at the same time. Two weeks later, Karen and her unpaid staff moved into the nightclub. She writes again, I remember that when we moved in, it was 20 or 30 degrees outside and it was about 20 or 30 degrees inside. We forgot to check if the building had heat before we moved in. It did not have heat and it did not have air. It didn't have a toilet, a sink, or a shower. It didn't have anything. We had to drive down to Hardy's to use the bathroom. Our new home came complete with cement floors and 17-inch sewer rats. We kept on trying to get the building upgraded, but nobody believed in us. Sometimes you wonder if you really heard from God or not. Karen and her staff continued working at their various places of employment. On payday, they would deposit their paycheck into their ministry account. Then they would each take $20 a week for living expenses. On weekends, they began going door to door in the projects, inviting children in their, uh, to their Saturday, uh, Sunday services. They made 4,000 personal visits every week. Every time, they won the respect and the trust of the parents in those communities. That was how Metro Assembly got its start. Today, Karen and her 16 member staff minister to over 3,000 children every week in multiple weekend, uh, weekend services. They sponsor a youth service that draws over 200 teenagers. They have established a private school in the community. They have 125 students enrolled and over 500 on a waiting list. But Karen and her staff have paid a price. They paid a price for the success they experienced. Metro Assembly has been broken into over 70 times. Several years ago, Karen was mugged. Three of their staff were beaten up by teenagers who attended one of their services. Most of the windows on their bus have been shot out. Ten of their children who attended their first church service have been murdered. The first funeral Karen performed was for one of her own staff members. Karen's response to all of this, if you decide that what God is asking you to do with your life is just too much on you and it's just a little too inconvenient, it's too much of an interruption then you will never see the miraculous he has for you. You know, the example that we see in the life of Karen is the example of someone who's willing to be interrupted. The God is a God of interruptions, and Karen is interruptible. The example that we see in the life of Mary is that God is a God of interruptions, and Mary was willing to be interrupted. The question that we have to wrestle with is are we willing to be interrupted? Let's pray. God, you have given us choice in this life. You've allowed us to, to make our decisions and to plan our futures. And we have plans and we do prepare. And a lot of our plans are good and our preparations are good. But we understand that sometimes you're calling us into the things that are even greater. Father, I pray that as we begin to worship now, Father, I pray that if you're calling us to something, if there's an interruption that you have for our lives, that we would be, that we would be interruptible, that we would have the same heart of Mary, knowing the cost, knowing the struggles that might be ahead, but still saying, I am the Lord's servant. I am the Lord's servant, and I am interruptible. We pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.